All right, let's get things started. Um, welcome everybody. This is Imagine Academy Quarantine Sessions number seven. Uh, this is covering a template generator light, which is a little known but very powerful feature within uh, Hyperdent version nine. So we're going to be talking all about that today. We've got a couple of experts on the topic, but before we settle into things, I'm just going to take care of a couple uh, housekeeping things. So um, first off, when it comes to microphones and video, if you could keep those turned off throughout the duration of the presentation today, we would certainly appreciate that. That allows us to uh, focus on the presenters. Uh, so mics and video off uh, for all attendees. Uh, if you do have any questions throughout the presentation today, definitely send those our way. Um, it's important to us that this be an interactive uh, presentation today. So if you have any questions to ask, things that you're wondering about, or if something just wasn't explained completely clearly, um, no problem. Just let us know via the chat function, which is down in the bottom corner uh, or bottom center of your screen there for Zoom. Uh, send a chat to me privately or to the whole group, and um, we'll be sure to uh, bring that up with the host and get your question addressed uh, um, during uh, throughout the presentation today. So any Q&A, send them our way uh, throughout the whole thing via chat, and we'll get them addressed. Um, last but not least, um, we are posting all of these quarantine sessions on our YouTube channel. So uh, simply hop on YouTube, do a search for Imagine USA and you'll find us. And uh, this one will be posted there within a couple of days as well as all of the previous six uh, that we've already done. So if you like what you see today and you wanna learn a little bit more uh, from these quarantine sessions, uh, by all means, let us know. Um, and hop on YouTube to, to view those. Uh, likewise, if you have some topics that you would like to see, uh, if there's something that you'd love to see a quarantine session about, uh, and we haven't done it yet, or we just don't have it scheduled, um, let us know, we, we take requests, you know? So uh, let us know what you'd like to see on here, and we'll be happy to uh, give it our best shot. So uh, without any further ado, I wanna uh, introduce our hosts and, and talk about the topic today. Um, um, Hyperdent, as many of you might know, is a CAM software used for, for dental nesting and uh, template uh, generation for the, the CAM files that we mill on five axis milling machines. Um, the templates within there, uh, companies like Imagine and Hyperdent and you know other ones, uh, put a lot of work into uh, refining those and getting those settings just right. Um, but there's always small variables that can have an impact on the final result you get out of the mill. And that's where um, a function such as template generator light can really save the day because it allows you to make small changes and adjustments um, to tweak the results that you get out of the mill to dial them in to be exactly what you want. Um, so that's what we're here to talk about today. Uh, joining me, I have two individuals, probably the biggest dental cam geeks you'll ever come across, and I do use that term very endearingly. Um, we've got Mark Fisher um, from Follow Me North America. He's the engineering manager out there. And then we've got my old friend Jordan Greenberg, who's the managing director at Follow Me North America. And these two individuals are the ones that really, um, you know, do a lot of work to develop and work with resellers like Imagine and others to present a really great product to the dental industry. So uh, Mark is gonna be doing most of the presentation <clears throat> today. Jordan is gonna be joining us uh, uh, via audio and he'll also be answering some questions via chat there on the chat line. So if you post any questions, Jordan might hop in there and answer them for you right away. But um, without any further ado, um, Mark, you can go ahead and take it away and, um, and you've got it from here. Thanks, Neil. Um, so uh, my mic's working, you can hear me? Yep, you sound good. And Mark, if you, if you don't mind if I cut you in line real quick and, and do a quick introduction uh, for you and a little more about the feature, uh, just so people know uh, who they're dealing with here. Uh, uh, first of all, hello from uh, Milford, New Hampshire. Mark's over in Golden, Colorado right now. Uh, unfortunately for a lot of lab guys, working from home is not uh, normal. Uh, but for us software guys, it's definitely standard operating procedures. So uh, we're happy to provide these seminars and these webinars for you. And we're going to continue them uh, moving forward as well. So thanks uh, to Neil and Imagine for, for organizing. Um, just to give you a little background, uh, Neil, I know touched upon a little bit of what Template Generator Lite is capable of doing. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know kind of why we came to the, the conclusion that it was necessary. Um, first of all, you know, dental cam, if you rewind far enough, uh, was something that uh, was quote unquote dumbed down or watered down uh, for, for dental lab uh, users that, you know, needed to do uh, advanced milling applications uh, routinely. 
Um, it, it was it was basically our industrial version of software uh, centered around dental restorations. Uh, we we realized or we learned very quickly there are a lot of uh, operations out there that have machinists that have CNC operators that needed our full blown modification tool called Template Generator. This is a, a very robust tool and it gives you uh, every single option that you would need to modify templates, uh, to make changes, to add tools, to add blanks, whatever it is that you need. Uh, definitely too much uh, for typical lab owners that just wanna make small modifications. So this is why uh, within the past couple of years, we started to discuss and create template, uh, template generator light, which gives you some usability in template generator, but it doesn't get you into trouble, so to speak. Uh, or it won't allow you to get into trouble, but it still gives you, gives you the flexibility that you need. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna hand it back off to Mark Fisher again, who is our engineering manager. And just to give you a little bit of his background, uh, he worked uh, in a hybrid of roles uh, for his past two employers that put him in the optimal position to learn all facets of Template Generator and of course, Template gener Generator Lite that's paired with it. Uh, he worked for a US-based implant manufacturer uh, where he was doing very advanced machining on very industrial pieces of equipment and then uh, moved over to a very high production uh, Crown and Bridge uh, milling center uh, out in Golden, Colorado where he continues to live. So uh, using his experience, he, he has a lot of uh, you know, test, uh, test basis. Uh, he, he's, he's milled hundreds and hundreds and thousands of crowns, uh, tweaking strategies, tweaking templates, tweaking parameters, and seeing what the resulting uh, effects are. So uh, again, without further ado, um, take it away, Mark. Awesome. Thanks. And uh, thanks, Neil, for putting this on. It's forced me to put on business attire today, which is not the, the worst feeling in the world, um, given how long it's gone on. Um, so, template generator light. Uh, Jordan already touched on template generator. The light option really it serves two roles. It serves uh, from one standpoint, it allows you to tweak um, strategies that you may that you might have gotten some sort of error with. Um, still allows you to uh, post code and and get a case out that might have required a distributor call. Um, the other option is that it it allows you to to improve the surface finish or, or, or change it um, to your liking. Um, the important thing to remember with template generator light is it's local changes to one part one time. Um, if you find that you like a setting and you consistently use it, um, you're like, hey, I'm always doing this with template generator light, definitely reach out to, um, to Imagine. Um, you know, uh, we're resources as well, um, but Imagine if that's your distributor and they can make that change permanently for you. Um, so we'll, you'll see what some of these changes are in template generated light, but it's, it's little options, uh, you know, such as enabling a, a higher detail point three burr or something like that coming in. If you're always toggling that on, you can have that permanently on and then turn it off. Um, that's not a problem. Or as Jordan mentioned, you could get template generator as a whole and then have access to all the strategies in the background and go nuts with this. Um, we, we provide training, we get to this point. Um, we typically don't just open that can of worms and just say, have fun, you have to have you know, some webinar training or, or, or remote, uh, we show up to your facility training. Uh, for today's webinar, I'm gonna be going through two different interfaces. Um, we've got our, Compact new interface, which is a uh, released last fall, and then we have our traditional one, which um, I suspect many of you on this uh, webinar right now are, are pretty familiar with this one here. Um, you can see both these machines right now. I've got a, a, a C clamp um, with the new release of V9. There's a lot of awesome features for C clamp. It, most of these features that we're talking about with template generator work with either. Um, I've got roughly the same presentation open in both because I want um, I want you to be able to see how to, how both interfaces work. Um, really, the kernel in the background is the same for these. They they just they go about it in slightly different ways. Hey, um, so, hey, Mark, sorry to butt in. Oh, Neil's probably going to say the same thing. Yeah, I'm not I'm not seeing your uh, your screen share. I'm only seeing your video right now. Nope, oh, that's boring. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you look good, but uh, there we go. A little better. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> nice. Can you see me anymore? Okay. 
Um, so You're smaller I, on the side. That's that's more acceptable for me. Okay, no no picking the nose. All right. So um, here's Compact New. You missed all that, but this is the new interface here. I'm going to be using both. Um, we've got C clamp. I uh, already discussed that. This is the interface that everybody's probably familiar with. Um, so let's just let's just jump right in and and, and cover the basics. So uh, most of you are going to have actually four icons here on on the right. You would have this fifth one right here in the middle if you actually had access to the full blown template generator. This icon here, um, it's got a little plus symbol next to it, means that there's something in the template that's that the distributor or whoever made the strategy, maybe it's you, um, decided that you can change as an end user. So if you click on it, this extra window will pop up. Um, there's one of the most common ones that, that people need to edit or know how to edit for five axis calculations is just how to simply open the boundary. Um, when we're talking about boundary, I've got a better presentation for full-blown training that does a better job explaining what the boundary is. Um, you have your offset, which is this uh, middle curve right here on a any restoration. And then you have this angle that goes up to the edge of the puck. Um, really, the, the reason for the angle is there's a couple of reasons. Number one, when you're roughing, it's bad form to have a straight wall. Um, your roughing burr is going to be in contact with the material, rubbing against the shank of the tool as it gets deeper and deeper in the material. And, uh, and then number two, it helps with getting uh, using five axis calculations if you're trying to, to, to tilt the burr and have it come in um, from a certain degree. And hyperdent for the longest time, and it's still this way, um, optimizes. So if you're using a, a certain size puck, this has all been set up by us or your distributor, it will open the boundary even, let's say a, a 25 millimeter puck versus a 16 millimeter puck. You need to, you need to create more of an opening um, if that's the case. Uh, so some other options, um, well, first off, is the, did all that come through? Because I just got the internet one. Yeah, I think we we heard you just fine, and and I think one thing that you you mentioned real briefly, but I'll make it clear to all the participants today, is um, template generator light. If it's something that you don't see in your current version of V9, um, it's something that you want to coordinate with your hyperdent reseller on. So if you purchase the software from Imagine, absolutely reach out to us. We can unlock this ability for you. Um, if you didn't, if you picked it up from somebody else, no worries, as long as it's V9 or higher, um, it has the ability to do this. But if you're, if that ability isn't readily available to you, um, a simple phone call to your distributor uh, should be able to unlock it. Uh, did, I, did I get that roughly right, Mark? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, um, you know, some of these features here, um, there's been, you know, lots of updates over certainly the last year. Um, so depending on when you, you got your latest database or what version of Hyperdent you're on, um, if you don't see some of these features and you want them, definitely reach out. Um, so going back to the boundary here, you know, I had that maybe a better a better picture of that. Um, but if I wanted to just simply open this boundary here. I got, uh, usually it would be some sort of error related to the boundary. This would be your first tip off um, where maybe I need to just slightly expand this. Um, I've seen this, especially if you're using really, really big material. This this, this would be a, a very inefficient way to nest this crown, um, but it's just in with this full arch. But some people with multi-layers, you know, they want the incisal edge to be sort of near the top of the, the material. And so they're gonna, you know, to do this, if you wanted to, you might get some errors because there's, your, your tool would have to be so long to, to rough this out. So in template generator light, you could just come in here and open the boundary angle or open the boundary offset. It's important to, to note that this is an incremental change and it will only let you make it larger. Uh, typically, strategies are, are set up to where the boundary is uh, is material effective as possible. It's going to use the smallest amount, um, and so really, an end user 
can only go in and store and open the boundary and make it larger. It's usually as small as it can be. Um, so you can get as many crowns per, per disc as possible. And this will let you open it a degree or two. So again, your angle would make this taper here to the edge bigger and your offset is actually gonna do both at the same time because if you make that this middle area bigger, your angle is gonna get naturally bigger as well. So um, this might be pretty subtle for, for a web video, but let, if I just put in two, you can actually see that the biggest uh, tip off was that these screws got larger, which tells me that there's actually now more distance um, from the edge of the roughing walls to the crown. And so that actually made this whole part bigger. Um, you could simply give this a recalculation here and, uh, and maybe that clears the alarm for you. Um, and, and before template generator light, this would have either required you having some sort of backup strategy. Um, some of you might be familiar with where you click on this and you would maybe have like a crown and like larger boundary or something like that. So that was kind of the older way of doing it. Whereas this one, uh, the nice thing about template generator light is that it, it keeps the consistency down. So there's fewer templates and everybody is, you know, you're not worried about going to a backup strategy that may not have had a, a change that you would want it um, put in there. So it, it's, it's fewer templates to manage it, which makes it easier for Distributors, makes it easier for us and everybody wins. So uh, that's really just to clear errors is not going to improve the quality of the part. Don't do this. I know um, some other cams where people they go in and they open the boundary because they think that it's going to get more detail around the side. Um, our cam does not work like that. It, it's it's going to get the detail that it's supposed to or it's going to let you know that it's not going to get it at all. So some people I, I've heard they just they want to go in and they open the boundary because they just think that the tool, the burr is going to now do a lot smarter things to get the side. It's going to do it or it's not going to do it and give you an error. So that's that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, so boundary, just to get parts out, out the door. Um, another easy one is enabling the point three burr. So some labs say it's definitely worth it. Some labs, um, think they can do without it. It's a personal preference. We're not trying to fight you either way. Um, we'll go ahead and I'll jump into the, into the new interface for a little change here. Um, if I click on this, back here. And actually one thing that I can note here real quick, Mark, while you're getting this ready is sure. we're gonna go through, you know, um, I don't know, uh, four or five or six different things that you can do with template generator light. But the really important thing to understand is that, you know, there's probably, you know, a couple dozen actual variables that you can change. And we're just demonstrating, you know, a half dozen of them. Um, so if you're, if you're intrigued by what you see here today and you're wondering if a certain variable could be changed with template generator light, you know, hit us up on the chat or, or you know, send us a message after the fact. But um, Mark's showing some of the highlights today, but it's definitely not a complete representation of all the possible things that could be changed. Exactly. Um, so uh, the point three bar, like I said, it, 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 some people, it's divided. Um, you know, there's really no arguing that it is. It's a smaller bar, it's gonna get more detail, but not every restoration may need it. Um, here's a perfect example here. You know, this crown here on the, on the right side of the screen um, arguably has not much detail on the top of 0.6. This, your standard 0.6 is probably gonna get all of that just fine. Um, this full arch here on the left, and we've got some pretty deep anatomy here. And you know, this, this part's gonna be in the mill for a couple of hours. So why not leave it in there for another four or five minutes and, and have it come out that much better. So that said, and the new interface, you still got the, a very similar icon, just slightly softer graphics. Still got the plus symbol here. I'm going to click on that. Uh, one of the advantages of the new one is that there's there is a little bit better picture associated with um, the different template options. Um, so Fissure Machining Point Three, I would just simply hit the checkbox. That's going to enable this tool path as a whole. I hit OK and then I hit Calculate. So magically my Point Three bird gets called up. If you're the type of uh, place where you're like, well, it's silly, I, I want the point three on all my restoration, reach out to Imagine, reach out to you know us um, or whoever your distributor is. And this is something that takes 
no time at all to set up as the default. And then you could do the same thing, but turn it off. Um, maybe if you knew that the design had absolutely no detail, you, you needed this crown to melt quick and put it in the oven. So let's not call it the 0.3. Um, you could just have, you could turn it, you could choose to turn it off and leave it on by default. So those are some of your options. Anything that I talk about, um, that's kind of another important note. Anything that I talk about, it's stuff where you could choose one as the default or the other. Um, you just need to let us know what your preference is. Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, in, in version 9.1 that is currently in beta and should come out sometime in the middle of the summer, uh, that's going to give you the opportunity or the option to uh, to, to create or, or choose which template is used by default for each part type anyway. Is that right? You don't yes. even have to go to your distributor in that case? Yep. So um, uh, we'll probably need to do a whole a whole separate video on that, and we're actually it's going to sort of allow us to redo how a lot of our thinking for for databases because we can really easily set up a, a slow, medium, fast sort of system and let people um, set their own defaults, and then that's the permanent default. So every crown that you bring in, if you're if you're a lab that you prefer the the 15 minute crown versus the 30 minute crown or you want something in the middle we can provide you know several options probably three is, is what we'll start with and uh and then let places depending on the volume decide um, which version they like the best and then and sort of exactly what i was talking about really the the, the slower template for for lower volume places or um, places that are after the absolute highest quality um, the slower one's just going to have the 0 0.3 enabled, and then if for whatever reason you broke your last one and you're out, you just still get parts out, you can go turn it off or choose the other one that you know won't have the 0.3 uh, by default. So, um, yeah, that's that's going to be out. Hopefully, um, I know with COVID and everything, it um, maybe made the timeline a little less certain, but I, I, I still feel confident because all of us work at home that, that still get that. Hopefully this summer time. Um, so some other options, bridges. Um, we've really tried to build in the most because honestly, these get the most um, support calls. Uh, you know, a crown, pretty standard. Um, we'll go through some other options here in a little bit for what you could do for like a simple crown. But bridges have by far the most variation. Um, one of the obvious variations is 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 whether or not you need to do five axis strategies on this occlusal part here. Um, Hyperdent has this tool path. Um, maybe some of you who kind of watched the little calculation dialogue are familiar with it. It's called segmented finishing. Um, it's a popular one for bridges because it tilts um, the, this bridge. It would probably divide this occlusal up into about 12 different segments and tilt it back and forth, you know, eight or 10 degrees to get undercuts on the lingual and then undercuts on the, on the buckle. Sometimes, though, doing five axis tool paths is, is you can often get more. It, it's you know you're, you're coming close to the fixture. I'll go into an example of why maybe might some cases might work and others might not. So if I double click this bridge here, I've I've logged into people's computers before and I've seen bridges that were so big that molar to molar it was about on the fixture. Um, we're talking like this big right here. So segmented finishing, if I told my my machine to tilt and try to get the undercut on this molar here, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get some sort of error. Um, a lot of people just assume that this bridge can't be milled. I've I've seen bridges chopped into multiple pieces before over this. Um, really with template generated light, you could say, well, I I'm, I know I can't really do five axis tool pass on, on this occlusal because it's going to get really close to the fixture. So we labeled here, um, this is in a, a standard Roland database, um, that I'm just going to turn off five axis and then turn on it's three plus, it's a four axis job basically. We're just going to come in just from the occlusal and get all the uh, just standard milling. So. Really, this tool path here, you can get away with doing it as long as, you know, I, I can't help you if your molar is uh, half a millimeter away from the fixture, because at that point you can't even put a burr between the part and the fixture. 
Um, so that really would be kind of the ultimate limit, but you can get away with slightly larger designs um, by just toggling this on and off. Actually, some people don't know this too, hyperdent. Um, you'll want to double check in the simulation the first couple of times you do this because it's a little bit unnerving for some people, but you can actually have the border on the fixture and basically it will just do the, the best it can to avoid, it, it will stay away from the fixture by a set amount. So this allows you to mill massive restoration, even if the, your border is slightly on the fixture. Um, and if you were gonna do this, you knew that you really weren't gonna get much undercut. So it would make sense. Um, I think many of you are probably familiar with the defined area. Um, but it would make sense to definitely take advantage of user defined if you were going to uh, turn off segmented finish. If you have a C clamp, it's really silly to not use user defined by standard anyway, because I mean, I'm, I'm able to come at this from 90 degrees and do things that I would definitely not have been able to do otherwise. So that would be just a kind of a quick example of turn off segmented finishing with template generated light. Get what you get the undercuts that you can with user defined and get the part out. The other sort of big one is fit. So all these restorations are going to have to go on either a prep tooth or a tie base. So we allow people to edit the amount that's going to be left on a part and i'll just jump back in jump back into this interface here and just real quick for anybody who's joined us since the beginning here uh if you have any questions or anything that you're wondering about uh as mark goes through his presentation here feel free to post them on the chat feed uh we'll be keeping an eye on that and we can um uh, refer those questions to mark when he has a moment there so Questions and answers, feel free to send them on through the chat. Sure. All right, so uh, fit to the tie base is, is, a, is a big support question. Um, you know, if the tie base is one of the features from CAD systems where you're not allowed to really go in and adjust the cement gap that's set. Um, so if your tie base are fitting slightly tight or too loose, um, you can get problems. Uh, you know, some people ask, well, you know, shouldn't all this be set up from the cam? Our cam is telling this to mill down to the STL, which should be right. Um, the important thing to remember, though, is that, you know, there's, if you use a system from a distributor, like Imagine, where you're getting the tools, you've got the material, you're, you have their libraries, you have their tie-based components, you're going to have way higher likelihood of, of everything working out. Inevitably, though, get a design from a doctor, you have another burr that you're testing or, or material or something like that, um, there can be slight tweaks that you need to make to the And all machines age, right? So if you getting kind of old, maybe the spindle has a little bit of run out. I think everybody knows what burr is sort of spinning like a, um, a little bit wobble. Um, but it could be over this loose spindle time until you decide that you need to replace the spindle. This is just something where you're kind of like, well, I need to. So high base, I click on template generator, and then I have finishing inside above my base. One of my favorite things, especially when I first started using Hyperdent, is just a, a, a regular user um, just plain English spelled out when you when you click on um, terms, uh, the, the, the help manual, if you go to the help column up here and then open the manual, it's searchable, you could just search for the term allowance. But basically it's how much is gonna be left over the part after this for further machine. So we're telling mill down to the exact SPL. To um, going negative now into the part and I could say let's over mill this by um, I, I tell people if they if they're having like a tight 
high base fit, you know, you can probably measure this with calipers and come up with some sort of number that you want to try initially. If you're doing tie base fit, uh, one thing to, to note on the allowance is that it's going to be half the amount because it's going to be half. It's it's a it's a circle, so you're telling it to take off 25 microns on this wall and 25 microns on this wall. So I'll exaggerate for easy math. If this is supposed to be three, and you mill a crown or you mill a, a bridge and it comes out as uh, let's say 2.9, so that would be 0.1 off, and so it would make sense to start half of that. So you would want to cut minus 0.05. Um, that would be where human hair is, I don't know, varies depending on what Google search you do. It's like 40 microns or something like that across. Um, so we're not even telling it to machine uh, less than a human hair on either side of these walls here. This would definitely be a number here where it's because of um, what machine you're using, maybe what material, what tools, whatever the case may be. You want to try to find this number, but you're not. This is not going to be a number that you want to change every single time. It would be a pain to just, ah, uh, yeah. Every time you get a tie base, you got to overmill it by 25 microns, and and you know people are going to forget to do that. So if you find a number that you're happy with, definitely um, let your distributor know for that. I'd like to lock in, and then this would just actually when you open this up, it would be zero again because in the template it's can have that hard minus 25 microns built into it. And then, you know, everything is, is load and go in perfect ability. Um, so this is definitely a big one. The fit on a crown is the exact same way. So if I come to crown and hit that, inside copings and our allowance. So I could overmill or undermill this. If I if I if I was having crazy loose fits for whatever reason, um, you would want to go positive. So you could go leave a positive 25 microns on this. And actually, for a crown, um, it's probably going to be. You would actually chase down the real number because it's not as much of a diameter like like the. Uh, you're actually measuring like a circle on the inside, so. That is why you would adjust allowance. And uh, that's a question that, that we get a lot and, and different places are happy with different numbers because some people, some people like tie bases that if they even had the slightest bit of rock to them, they're not happy with it. So those, those places might actually want to tighten up and then they're happy. Um, Hey, Mark, one quick question here we've got from the yeah. audience. Um, this is an IMS I-Core user who's wondering, um, can Hyperdent increase the angle while using the C-clamp? How much is the maximum angle the user can use on it? And from my recollection, uh, I want to say it's about 30 degrees plus or minus on the, like the 350 series. Um, and that's kind of a limit set by the machine, right? So does, does the cam have much of an influence in that? And if so, does it factor in with template generator light at all? Um, what do you think? So, so the the angles. Um, if you have a C clamp, and uh, when your distributor, it, or imagine logs in and sets you up with V9, one of the things that they need to do is they need to actually come in and open up the the kinematics for your IMS. Um, just go to IMS edit. This is Hyperview, and when you go to uh, when you want to do 90, de 90 degree machining, this is the axis here where you had uh, it would have been the default in V8 because you were not able to do that aggressive um, milling. It's probably 25 degrees, um, and then if you want, you can open this up to negative. It would actually go to negative 91, and so this allows the hyperdent to think it can do the 90 degree milling which it can now. So if you want, again, that's this is in Hyperview. This is, if, you, if you're unsure of this, uh, reach out to Imagine um, and they'll, they'll be able to check this for you. But as far as the 
you still have your, that would be, this is considered your unlimited axis, right? Because they can spin, doing this poorly, but this can spin all the way around 360 degrees without a problem. You have another axis that, that can only go up and down by a certain amount. That's not going to be adjusted at all. Um, so I would, I would think you're still probably not going to have like a better machine a, a implant channel now that's 75 degrees because you're still going to have to flip it on both sides and you're probably going to come into contact with the fixture. Really, the 90 degree machining was so you could do um, finishing on the front part here. Does that answer the, the question good enough? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Cool. Um, okay. So, some of the other things that you can do, and some of these points here are, they're not template generated per se, but they're options that are built into the template that people um, find just as useful as template generated light. Um, one of them is being able to access tool paths for three plus two. Um, three plus two is when your machine locks into one position and then it, um, you know, does the milling five axis is when it actually looks very fluid. Yeah, I'll just show you here. So many of you who've been in this screen here might have noticed that there's a checkbox here that says has undercut. People have known right away what this does, and it has to be built in, purpose built into the template to actually do anything. Um, if I tell this that it has undercut, that we're uh, a little bit further into the presentation, I'll show you guys the real. There's a finishing inside uh, coping cavity with undercuts, and it's told to do some boss finishing and this is going to help get um, maybe a weird design that has um, undercuts in the design and if what's nice about this is if you have a bridge you could do it to just you know you have your 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 two coping lines you don't have to do it to both of them you could have one of them do simultaneous five and one of them do three plus two um, would just choose which one it wants to do um, without a problem so you have that and the shortcut to that is you can just right click on this and go change undercut property of coping and then say coping has no undercut. This is going to be the default. You right click this again, go coping. That's much quicker to me than going to the others. You can display your undercuts with this icon here. It's not going to have any. Um, there's, there's different opinions out there on if you should have undercuts at all, because um, how's the how's it gonna go on the, the prep tooth? Where's it gonna go? Inevitably, there's designs that have it and it needs it. So um, that's, and go ahead and talk about um, screw channel categories, because this, this is another big one um, because it allows you to get cases out that you definitely would have had a hard time doing before. This is full blown. This is what the templates look like in the background. Um, you have categories to, to do screw channels that might be too long for your burr. Um, that's sort of the, the easy example that I start with for everyone. Um, if you click on Screw channel, uh, compact new. Go to our little prepare mode here. Plant interface. If I find now the error is probably going to be like if you have a screw channel that says like stop due to collision with tool shank. Um, usually that's because a lot of times. It's if you're trying to do a screw channel, the tool is. So if I want 
when I mark screw channels, now a lot of people have CAD data. You should hopefully have CAD data that's marked screw channels for you. It will come in as a default category one. If I needed to do this from two sides, which would allow me to do a screw channel that was twice as large as my burr was actually sticking out, I could change this category here from category one to category two. And then in the template that's built in to call up a toolpath that's going to do 50% from the connection side and 50% from the occlusal side. So this would just be a very simple change that you could do. And I could leave the rest of these on category one um and do them one shot from the occlusal and then bridge mill spine clears the air so this would have been a, an, again another a previous support call hey what do i do um we're really working on making these consistent because a template writer could set these up however they want they could be like ah, i'm gonna have category seven do this or category 12. um we're really trying to make consistency so people have an understanding between different machines um even different I, we're trying to just for different distributors so people are just aware that category one one shot on the occlusal to me the trick is category two generates two tool paths and it will do 50 percent top bottom so that's definitely a handy trick um hyperview um, a lot of you are probably familiar with if you do a whole session on hyperview is the simulation software um, it's really good to know how to use this, uh, but it's it this would just be a quick way to check and just show you 50% from the top and 50% from the bottom. So I have this one right here, which is set up as screw channel two millimeter, closal only. Turn that on. There's one. Does it all the way to the tie base, and then we've got category two set up for this other one. Not that this bridge technically needed it, but it's just a good example. And you can see that it does. The Hyperview is a, uh, a great tool to have. Uh, one difference that you'll notice between on this is that you've got Different, uh, another part type that you might not have been used to if you've been using Hyperdent for a while, we've got full arch built in now. Um, previously, this was called an abutment crown bridge. And the, the issue that we started to discover was that there's a drastically different way that you need to machine this bridge right here and this bridge right here. This one here on the right, it's technically still an abutment crown bridge, but it's much smaller. You really don't need to do a lot of five axis stuff to it. There's no CEJ area, there's none of that stuff. So having the part type for abutment crown bridge allows people to choose the part type and then the strat suits a full arch versus an abutment crown bridge. Really the main differences are that a full arch is gonna have a, a border that's, that's expanded naturally larger to accommodate segmented finishing and these these uh, higher chance that you're going to do five axis tool pass, whereas an abutment crown bridge is going to have a little bit smaller border because it more mimics like a three unit crown bridge. You don't need the, the opening to be massive or anything like that. What's nice though is that you can totally swap between the two versions of them, pretty much with template generated light. So if I did want to switch this back to three axis or five axis. Really the, the main difference is that you're toggling between things here. So like an above crown bridge is gonna have the three plus one enabled as standard, whereas your full arch is gonna use five axis tool path. And so one can definitely easily become another if you just toggle between them. So if you do have a, a small three unit above crown bridge that you wanna do, simultaneous five axis on or three plus two, you can go in and enable it that way. Um, another play generator light one is that a lot of type bases out there are engineered to be machined with either uh, flat end mills or, or smaller tools. And so you can come in here and enable a 0.6 and then that's gonna 
drop your smallest tool and then mill right now that we have the stock tool for this machine. Um, but this is usually enough to clean up any sort of sharp corners that you would have that might have been uh, preventing you from, from milling the tie base good in the first place. So uh, the 0.6 is, you can just toggle it on real quick. If, again, if you're using this all the time, just let us know. We'll enable it as a standard. So we've got um, about, um, is there any, I can go into sort of template generator as a whole. Is there any other questions that have popped up that people? Mark, I think another popular use for template generator light is to modify the, the, the surface finish on, on crowns or any part for that matter. Uh, do you have anything set up with uh, Toolpath that's activated for uh, you know step downs on the finishing sequence. Yeah, yeah. So if we go to a crown here, what Jordan's talking about is your step over. So in toolpath terms, that weigh in on a finishing. That's these whatever you want to call them, fingerprints, tree rings, whatever. That's the distance between these yellow lines here. And these are set from in the strategy. Higher is going to be a greater step over between the two the tool paths. Some people actually prefer a uh, well. Some people want a finer surface finish. They want they want to see less of the tool path lines. We've even gotten requests that the the crown looks too polished, and it looks. Uh, some people even say you know it doesn't look as realistic stain glaze and stuff like that on there and I and I prefer a little bit of rougher surface uh, texture but you can do either um, in template generator light you can come into your step over here and you could play you could go higher on this um, I tell people you know there's a lot of ways to learn step over probably the easiest is just to have, you know you could use the, the engraving feature and put 0.25 on the inside of this crown and 0.2 on that one um, and then See what they look like the next day after they come out of the oven or PMA right away. And this would give you a, a bigger step over, or I could drop this down and have a finer surface finish. So we have sort of that middle approach. This will probably be another thing where earlier we were talking about version 9.1 that has. Um, these will be things that we have sort of already locked in. You could still edit them if you really wanted to, but just so places have the options right out of the gate, to just go, hey, I want the, the fastest one. And if you find that you like the number just have your distributor lock in your, your preferred step over for that part type. Great, thanks. We, we have another question here too, uh, slightly unrelated uh, to the surface finish. Well, completely unrelated, um, but it's re regarding flat embers in rolling machines uh, and, and whether or not there's any advantages to using them. Uh, I, I think it depends uh, very strongly on the type of part or the application you're using it for. Mark, can you, can you think of any good uses for a, a flat ember in a, in a machine that only utilizes soft materials like the rolling? Yeah, so um, there's some tie bases where people have an easier time machining with uh, sharp end mills. This one here is not one of those designs because I'm zooming way in right now. And a good tie base that would out of either CAD system should be designed to be milled properly with a ball mill. So that's going to have a, a rounded edges. Um, some of them, though, depending on the library, have these crazy 90 degree corners that have to be machined with flat end mills. Um, and there's a couple of different ways to do that. You could either, that's why we, for the soft material machines that don't have the end mill standard, we have, you can toggle on the 0.6, which does a lot better job getting closer to that 90 degree corner, um, much better than the one. And a lot of times that's enough to do it. Um, for roughing and stuff like that, there's, um, not really a ton of advantage to using like a square end mill in the roll in. Um, there's uh, the roll ins, you're really not pushing them crazy aggressive and roughing. Um, so there's some um, 
um, shaped tools out there, which is uh, sort of a people call them different things. Basically, has a radius on the corner, and that does a little bit better job. At, in dental, we do everything we machine is uh, called, you know, it's an organic shape. We're not milling these perfect squares. And so if you're roughing, a lot of times it's better to use stuff that has sort of the, the sloped edges. Because if I'm roughing this, if I used a square end mill, a lot of, this would come out after roughing. It would look quite choppy. It would have like basically stair steps in it where you could see the, the square end mill not able to get any detail whatsoever. So using these rounded edges, a lot of times it's better for these um, curves like that. So not saying there's not people out there using square end mills. Um, with template generator as a whole, you can come in and you can add, we go settings, tools. This would be a, a feature that you would have if you had template generator. Um, I've got one here built in for calibration cubes. So I've, I've set up stuff for people on Roland where they, they're, they're getting parting lines and you know, they've tried calibrating everything they can think of. And I've just set up like a, because of a perfect cube that's very easy to measure. You would want to use an end mill for something like that. It's not really a production part, but you could certainly add and copy if you wanted to experiment with end mill. It, turn this right into an end mill. I got my diameter here. Three. So really, I'm I've I've gotten to this screen here as sort of a taste. Of, if you're interested in adding different tools and you think this is stuff that you would want to take a project that you would want to take on yourself, this is pretty much how easy it is to add tools. I decide what what pocket in the machine I want to put it in. The the tiny learning curve. It's about the most intuitive strategy editor tool editor out there. Yeah, I think it's it's been our experience with, with flat tools and, and roughing situations that as much as it might uh, remove material more aggressively in, in, in those stages, uh, it leaves more work to be done in the stages that follow. Um, so we, uh, I know we've, we've played around with some, some other tooling options where you're coming back with other large diameter tools in order to address those large steps. But uh, the, the simple answer here is that, uh, you know, the advantages that we find using flat embers is, is only in uh, internal 90 degree radius corners or very sharp radius corners on the inside. Yep. Great. And that was, this is earlier, the, a lot of people don't know that there's a, you have your information here for screw channels if you just kind of hover over the part. You've got a diameter, which is 3.19, um, and then it tells you that's 3.99 once you add this the scaling factor, and then it tells you the length, 14.8. So if my burr only has 16 millimeters of reach and I'm trying to machine a screw channel 16.1, probably going to get that shank error, and changing this to category two would, would clear that. Great, Mark. Do you think we could uh, we could hop into full blown template generator? Show how it relates to some of the template generator light features we've introduced today, and then also some of the additional features that are available to everyone once they uh, go with the full blown option. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's one or, or two other things that I thought of that you know I, I I've seen on people's computers. They're they're just super quick things that are handy tips. Um, one of them is a lot of times now that people are doing lots of C clamps, they'll get these uh warnings all the time hey your mill boundaries outside the blank if you want to get rid of those you can just come up to settings general and then your consistency check my mill boundaries outside the blank don't even let me know that i'm fine with the mill boundary out but let me know if the part is outside the like that would clear out um if anybody saw that warning about that so let's jump into Generator. If I open template generator, this might be totally new to lots of you, and in just a few minutes, it's probably not going to do it a whole lot of justice. Um, but 
any setting that I click on, if I see a little black box that has an X next to it, that means that I can for overwrite for an end user. So um, let's take uh, finishing inside a bump and base example. We've already went through this. So I can say my allowance is I'm allowing this to be overridden. There's another kind of interesting one down here that says avoid collision. And this might freak a lot of people out. Well, it's set to no. The reason why this is set to no is that when if it finds that there's um, an angle or a feature that it can't mill, uh, uh, stop the calculation and let you know that it can't do it. Some people, all else fails, I'm fine doing some bench work and just grinding this out. Um, it's not ideal. Um, but sometimes that's the only solution. And so you could say yes, software to find an alternative milling track to the serial and just basically do the best you can. A lot of tool paths like finishing a uh, occlusal side and stuff like that will have this built in where you're telling it to avoid the collision. Yes, because it would be a little bit silly to, to say, uh, to throw an alarm anytime that the tool found something on just the occlusal of the bridge, but a feature like a tie base you would you would maybe want to turn that off. This template here has, you can see all this stuff built in with the category. Um, so you have category. Um, this is what's choosing. Again, screen a little bit bigger, guys. Hyperdent, the, the strategy editor is super intuitive. You've got category two, where do you want it to start? Uh, just start in, the, in an automatic position. Where's the machining depth? I've got my beginning of the screw channel, end of the screw channel. Do I want to go a little bit beyond that? Positive value, cut deeper. So these are where this is what you you do to build a strategy. A lot of people will just copy strategy. And once you get good at making strategies, you learn how to copy one. So you're not really always having to build stuff from scratch. It takes a little bit longer to build stuff from scratch. But once you decide how you like to rough PMA, or you can copy lots of these settings and then sort of just change out features um, to other part types. Um, if this is something that you're interested in, you know, I even made this little reference guide here that has all these different part types and tool paths and what works for what part type. So you can't a edit a overall finishing cavity side bridge. You know, you can't put that on a single crown. It's not not going to be a tool path that's enabled. But once you work where all you have to do is change the tool path out and say, hey, instead of finishing the outer area cavity side on a bridge, I'm going to finish it on a crown, I can start to just waterfall out that I know I like all the spindle speeds and everything like that, um, make it work for everyone. That's kind of another important note for template generated light. You know, not every setting is, is, is enabled for that for kind of the reason where um, there's certain settings where unless you're an advanced user, you really shouldn't really have access to um, spindle speed. Definitely see how if, if we said, yeah, you could override the spindle speed, you would have people that, you know, I might accidentally put 230 in instead of 23,000 or something like that. And so really, we just wanted people to edit stuff that lets them tweak the, the final surface finish on the part or, um, or so maybe clear an error like a boundary error that they weren't able to. And uh, you know, if if any of this in the background um, looks appealing to you, um, definitely let us know. Yeah, Mark, that's a that's a good point. Uh, basically, you know, someone who goes ahead and changes the spindle speed usually that's relative to a feed rate or the depth of cut uh, based on how much material you're trying to remove uh, with that tool for that operation. So that's the type of stuff that we tried uh, to keep hidden. Uh, from direct end users that only have access at this point and not the machining knowledge for template generator light. Uh, once you do, uh, you know, full blown training on template generator, not only do you learn how to use that tool, but you also learn, uh, you know, machining theory as well uh, in order to optimize what it is that you're trying to do so that you're not, not just blindly, you know, picking away at uh, certain options. You want something to mill faster. So you just speed it up without having the, the, the depth of cut or the spindle speed to go along with that change. So good point. Yep. Yeah. Template generated light is not going to have you know, advanced CNC options. It's just toggling 
surface finishes and stuff like that. And would, would, they really they uh, gathered basically all the requests that were common from distributors and, and what they had to do to get a part that to calculate and enable those. Great. So it looks like it's three o'clock. I don't have any other questions here in the chat box. Neil, uh, you, you going to take it home or? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So uh, Mark, you did a great job.